Hey y'all, and welcome back to another episode of Cause of Death. I am the Appalachian Sun, and it's another aircraft accident, but we're going to talk about the helicopter crash that took the life of Stevie Ray Vaughan. This is meant to respectfully remember him and those who were aboard the aircraft that day. Nothing about death is pretty, but if you like this content, please like, subscribe, and uh, fill out the advanced directive for notifications of future content. I've tried to record this video so many times and there's so many outtakes, it's almost hilarious. So thank you for bearing with me. I'm new at this, the lights, the sound, we're gonna get where we need to be. So let's get started. On August 26, 1990, Stevie Ray Vaughan would front his band for the last time. He was in the Elkhorn Valley, the Alpine Valley Ski Resort in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. The Alpine Valley Ski Resort in East Troy, Wisconsin. Tickets for the show were only $29 with parking included, and the event was billed as an evening with Eric Clapton featuring Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble, as well as the Robert Cray Band and the Memphis Horns. Others in attendance were Buddy Guy, as well as Stevie Ray Vaughan's brother, Jimmy Vaughan. The Robert Cray Band performed first. Next up was Stevie Ray Vaughan, and by all accounts, he destroyed the stage from start to finish. And this was confirmed in an interview with Eric Clapton in Rolling Stone magazine that he was just absolutely legendary in the him and Jimmy Vaughn and Buddy Guy and Robert Cray were all standing to the side with their jaws dropped. After Stevie Ray Vaughn finished his set, Eric Clapton came on and put on a killer show himself. He finished with um, his infamous Sunshine of Your Love. And then, you know, like every asshole musician, he walks off the stage and then comes back out for the encore. But for the encore, it was, it was really something special. He called out Stevie Ray Vaughn Robert Cray, Buddy Guy, and uh, Jimmy Vaughn, and they played Robert Johnson's Sweet Home Chicago before they hopped on a squad of helicopters bound for that place. After the show, four helicopters were lined up on the golf course waiting to take Eric Clapton and the entourage to Chicago. The propellers were turning. There were 16 seats available, so that's four passengers, and then there's room for the pilot as well inside of these particular helicopters. Stevie Ray Vaughan, his brother Jimmy, and Jimmy's wife Connie were supposed to be on board of the helicopters, but something happened at the last minute and the Vaughn brothers were informed that there was only one seat available. So Jimmy decided to stay on the ground with his wife and Stevie took the available seat. So the helicopters were lined up one, two, three, four, and the helicopter we're gonna talk about today was the third in the row. This is the helicopter that Stevie Ray Vaughan boarded along with Eric Clapton's manager, Nigel Brown, uh, security, Bobby Brooks, and the assistant manager for the tour, Colin Scythe. I could have the jobs of the first two guys mixed up. I apologize if I do Bobby Brown and Ni Nigel Brooks. Seem like super British names. I apologize. I just had some peanuts. The pilot for the third helicopter was Vietnam veteran Jeff Brown. The final NTSB, or National Transportation Safety Board, report tells the story as each helicopter took off in succession, but the third helicopter failed to gain the appropriate altitude before subsequently crashing into a ski hill three quarters or three fifths of a mile away from the takeoff point. And that seems like a very vague description of what happened everything happened quickly within a matter of a few minutes but because of the people who were on board of the helicopter that wasn't going to be good enough so a man by the name of colin cahoon he is an author uh, an army veteran helicopter pilot would remember his boss walking into his office dropping a file on his desk and saying figure out what happened so colin cahoon enlisted the help of a man named joe kettles a helicopter pilot with over 20,000 hours of flight time. They rented an identical Belgette Ranger. They assembled a defense team 
and they went to Elkhorn, Wisconsin to try to recreate and figure out what actually happened that night. The investigators, Cahoon and Kettles, were behind the controls of an identical helicopter and they departed the golf course from the exact same location at the same time. And what they discovered is that everything was well lit because of the parking lot lights, but as soon as they rose above the parking lot lights, because it's a ski valley, all the surrounding hills blocked out the light from any other direction. And so this created a black hole just above the lights. Kettles, who was in control of the helicopter, looks at his instrumentation, puts the helicopter into a climb to reach the appropriate altitude, and then the city lights revealed themselves above the hill. They went back the next day, and they ran the, they ran the scenario several times, and with each iteration, they didn't come anywhere near the ski hill. They concluded that in order for the helicopter to crash into the ski hill, which was a 300 foot hill, and they crashed into, you know, just missing it by 50 feet. Uh, the, the pilot missed the top of the hill by 50 feet, which is tragic. But the first thing that we learn from Cahoon's findings is that the pilot, Jeffrey Brown, wasn't certified to fly the helicopter with his instruments, and this is one of the correlations to the previous video. The pilot wasn't certified to fly the aircraft in low visibility conditions by his instruments alone. However, he was legally able to be assigned to taxi the tour crew because the night was considered visual meteorological conditions, which qualified him to be assigned to the job. The second thing that we learn is the pilot, Jeff Brown, I'm not sure of the timeline, but he had recently failed an instrument check ride. So there's two red flags for him being assigned to a high profile job flying at night in the North Midwest where there's gonna be fog, the weather can change in an instant. So Kettles and Cahoon are behind the controls of an identical helicopter and they're running the scenario in the daytime and they realized that in order for Jeff Brown to hit the ski hill, he would have needed to apply uh, a 40 degree right turn. And that's another thing that links this story with the Patsy Klein plane crash story that I told previously, is that when the pilots went blind in their low visibility conditions, they both applied an imperceptible downward right turn. And I don't know why I find this fascinating or why this is a thing that someone might do, but if you're a pilot, let us know why someone may, um, I'm gonna use the word imperceptible, and that's the word that Colin Cahoon uses to describe Jeff Brown's um, take on the controls. Another thing that I had to do before I think I was able to make this video any good is to understand how incredibly difficult it is to pilot a helicopter. So there's a control for one hand, there's a separate control for the other hand, and then there's a control for each foot. And in order to maintain balance in a helicopter, I'm gonna link a video to the, the controls of the exact same helicopter below but in order to maintain balance and the forward mobility and all the things that you need to control the helicopter, each one of these four individual things needs to be maintained in balance. So add in an entire front panel of gauges that if you don't understand them, you're in trouble. So as soon as Jeff Brown rose above the parking lot lights, he went blind in that black hole that Cahoon had found during the investigation and he wasn't able to read his well-lit instrumentation. And it's surmised by the investigators that he had absolutely no idea that anything was wrong until the moment before impact. So the veteran pilot, Joe Kettles, has an idea. He puts Cahoon, the, the, the other investigator, behind the controls of the helicopter and says, when we get above the parking lot lights, close your eyes. He's in control of the helicopter. He gets up to the parking lot lights and the dude's like, close your eyes. And so from, from the passenger's pilot seat, the pilot, there's room for a secondary pilot. But Jeff Brown didn't have an assistant or a second person in control of the helicopter. But you can fly this individual helicopter from either side. So the main controls are on the right side. Cahoon is in control of the helicopter. They're ri he's rising up. Kettles tells him to close his eyes. So he closes his eyes and 
Kettles, from wherever he is aboard the helicopter at this time, applies that 40-degree right turn. And then he tells the dude, hey, open your eyes, and right there is the ski hill. Kettles, the, the, the more advanced pilot, takes control, puts the helicopter into an emergency climb, and they barely miss the top of the hill. But this showed them what happened, or this explains what happened. When the pilot went blind, he imperceptibly, because of all the controls necessary to maintain balance and forward mobility and the gaining of altitude to, for him to have been able to achieve the altitude he needed to gain to get over the ski hill and see the lights and reach where he would be qualified to fly, he, without knowing it, applied this downward right turn, just like the pilot in the previous video. And the helicopter crashed into the side of the hill. There were no witnesses. The autopsy report of Steve Ray Vaughn says the cause of death is exsanguination, which is massive bleeding out. And this would be concurrent with a helicopter crash due to the lacerations from parts of the vehicle. Uh, you would also see this in other cases, but that there, and of course there are subsequent causes of death such as fractures and impact wounds. Colin Cahoon would win in court with his findings that the pilot Jeff Brown should not have been assigned to taxi the tour crew that night because he had failed an instrument check ride and he was not qualified to pilot the plane or pilot the helicopter in low visibility conditions. And because of this, the company OmniFlight Incorporated that the helicopters were rented from that night would pay tremendous settlements, but that would never make up for the lives lost in that early morning hour of August 27th, uh, shortly after midnight. If you're interested in cemetery tourism, Stevie Ray Vaughan is buried at the Laurel Land Memorial Cemetery, or Memorial Park, I believe, in Dallas, Texas, under his birth name, Stephen Ray Vaughan. He was 35 years old. And an interesting tidbit of information that I found is that on the night of August 25th, 1990, Stevie Ray Vaughan would have a dream where he witnessed his own funeral. He would tell his bandmates about that dream on the morning of August 26th, and in the very early morning hours of August 27th, he would be aboard a helicopter that was mistakenly piloted into the side of a ski hill. We'll always have his music. Let's talk about it below. Uh, what's your favorite Stevie Ray Vaughan song? I grew up with my stepdad coming home and cracking a beer and putting his music on. I wasn't able to find the cemetery information on uh, Bobby Brooks, Nigel Brown, or Colin Scythe, but if you have that or they live near you or are buried near you, uh, pay your respects or let us know below. Uh, the information for the pilot, Jeff Brown, is available on Find a Grave, but I'm omitting that here. If he's buried in your area and you decide to pay a visit, please remain respectful. Uh, though he was piloting the plane that took Stevie Ray Vaughan from us, he should not have been assigned to the case in the first place. With that said, please remain respectful if you're in the vicinity of OmniFlight Incorporated as well. Um, these things are in the past. Please like, subscribe. Follow me on Instagram at the Appalachian Sun. Fill out the advanced directive to be notified of future episodes. And uh, remember, time waits for no man. Hello and welcome to another Vidi show. Vidisode. A uh, boom, boom, boom. Wickedy whack. I was able to find the set list for the performance and I've made a playlist on Spotify. The link will be in the description below. Also, uh, the link for the videos, there is video footage of the final performance. Those will be in the description as well.